we're back. Yep, welcome to Bad Influence, returning with all your old favourites, including some fat reviews. This week, our panel look at Jurassic Park on the Mega Drive. And we've got a first look at the game everybody's talking about, Mortal Kombat. And in my first report from America, I've been looking at the latest in games technology that can produce pictures like this. Me, 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 me. I'm back too. It's me, Fertilis. Over here, over here. Right. I'm all ready for the new program with my bad influence pencil case, rubber and ruler set. I've also got some multicoloured felt tips and a brand new sheet book. Right. Now for the first cheat of the new series. <laughs> it's for Super Swift on the SNES. Now, normally on Super Swift, you have to choose to control either the helicopter or the jeep. But this cheat lets you control both at once. Simply press select on the title screen and then start an A. So, that's select and start an A. And now I can attack from both the ground and the air together. <laughs> right, if you'll excuse me, I just think I'll uh, finish off writing my address. Yes, ah, here we are. Um, Namrud, star of Bad Influence. Yes, the shed, that's right. Behind the studio, Leeds, Britain, the world, solar system, the universe. Yes, and the cosmos. A somewhat unscheduled interruption, the first of many, I'm sure. Hey, are you tired of typing? Are mice making you miserable? Are you jaded by joysticks? Then what you need is one of the new personal computers that you can write on. Hey, right on. This one's called the Pen Pal. It was launched by Amstrad earlier this summer. It has the capability to be a phone book, a diary and a notepad, and you can put additional software in this little slot on the back here. Now, when you first use this machine, you have to teach it how you write. Not how you write, because it understands the letters. How you write, because it's got to understand how you form each letter. So, let's do B. Train B. Capital B. And tick. Now it's learned how I do a capital B. I put all the other letters in before the programme, so now if I write my name, it should recognise it no problem at all. Uh, a N D Y C R A N E. Angracrano. Well, close, I suppose. But how does the computer understand your handwriting? I can usually read Andy's handwriting because I understand the meaning of the words. Makes sense of that then. Hmm. Uh -huh. Okay, so. This first word is either going to be meat or melt. But even Andy isn't going to want to melt me in the canteen, so it's got to be meat. The computer doesn't know that, though. It doesn't understand the meanings of the words, so it has to use a different technique. The computer learns the way you write its letter. It records where you put the pen down first and then follows you all the way around to the end. Now, that pattern that ends up, if it matches something in its memory, all well and good. But then again, sometimes your small e's end up as small s's. <laughs> Apple have bought out their own electronic message pad called the Newton. It tries to get past this problem by comparing each word you write with its own inbuilt dictionary. So it'll only let you write proper words. There you go, meat and melt. But I get rid of that because it's a lot of fun. It's more expensive, but you can write any way you want on the page and you can write in joined up handwriting too. So it's just like using a pen and paper, really. Soft. And now it's Tom for our frast revoir. I think he means that now it's time for our first review. No, that's not what it says here, though, is it? <laughs> it's Jurassic Park. There's only one film, but there are loads of different versions of the games. The SNES game comes in interactive surround sound. The PC version has the best graphics. And at the other end of the scale, there's the Game Boy version. They're all due for simultaneous release on October the 22nd. But first to hatch is the entirely different Mega Drive version. Here's Sir Hale. Jurassic Park is an average platform game hyped on the back of a major film license. You can either play Dr. Grant or as a raptor. Here I'm playing Dr. Grant. Dr. Grant has got various things that he can do. He can swing from ropes and as he falls he can shoot the dinosaurs with various weapons which are displayed in a box in the top left hand corner of the screen. He's got various weapons such as a dart, a red dart, an electricity bolt and a bomb. The scrolling on the game is rather jerky, but the animation on the central character itself is quite good. Being the raptor is better than being Dr. Grant, although it's so easy to kill people. You just jump on them. You don't even need all three buttons. The jump wants enough to get through the first level. It's almost too easy. I'm really disappointed with this game. I would have thought they'd come up with a better game for such a big film title, and it doesn't follow the plot of the film much either. I think it's overrated, just like the film. Unless you're wanting to buy this game for it being Jurassic Park, I recommend Alien 3. 
as the game has the advantage of actually having a plot. This game has great graphics, but the control system lets it down. And so the final scores for Jurassic Park on the Mega Drive. The girls gave it an average score of 3 out of 5, and the boys agreed with them. They gave it 3 out of 5 as well. I really enjoyed that Jurassic Park movie, especially when all the computer-generated dinosaurs ate the people. Actually, I've been fertling around with a computer-generated version of me. It's only a prototype, but I'll let you see it if you like. <laughs> I can make him walk. I can make him run. And I can make him eat people. Ah! Oh, get off! Uh, uh, oh, well, nothing to worry about. Uh, uh, this is a cheat for cyborg justice on the Mega Drive. All you have to do is pause the game while you're in arcade mode, then press in C, B, B, C, C, A, C, B to get a secret option screen. Uh, oh, get off, you digital dumb beetle, or I'll wipe your wireframe and put your pixels, you grotty graphic. And you can peruse the reviews and loads of other information in our data blast, which appears at the end of the programme. If you're watching last series, you'll know how it works, but if not, this is how you access it. All you need is your Commodore Garden video recorder. And the bit of the programme to record is the credits, the last 30 seconds, where everybody's name shoots across the bottom of the screen. When you've done that, rewind it and play it back, but don't play it back at the normal speed. Play it back using your pause and frame advance. And when you've done that, more than 90 different pages of information will become available to you. Now we're going to be having regular reports from Z Wright in America. For the first programme, he's been having a look at all the new stuff stateside. The hottest news from the US is happening in that building behind me. But before we take a look, here's a quick rundown of what's hot and what's not. Every other game released nowadays is tied to a movie. The hottest is Virgin's Aladdin based on an animated Disney movie. The graphics are being produced by Disney animators. Virgin's other big movie tie-in is Demolition Man the Game, based on Demolition Man the movie starring Sylvester Stallone and Wesley Snipes. The actor shot some special footage during the production of the movie to be digitized into the game. LucasArts are putting the final touches to Super Empire Strikes Back. And they're also developing two new Star Wars titles, TIE Fighter and this one, Rebel Assault. But actually, the most interesting news is about what's known technically as vaporware. Everybody's been talking about it for months, but it really doesn't exist yet. One example is Sega's home virtual reality headset. They had a prototype version of it at a big computer show in Chicago in June, and they told us we could have it today to show you. Then they changed their mind. Another fascinating piece of vaporware is the so-called Action Game Master. As far as we can tell, it only exists in this picture, but it's supposed to play Super NES, Mega Drive, Master System, and NES, and CDs. Personally, I'm waiting for the Mark II version, which will no doubt make toes, tidy your bedroom, and probably land a man on Mars. But one piece of vaporware that is slowly condensing into reality is 3DO. And this is their headquarters in California. Now, if you haven't heard of 3DO, hey, where have you been? It's the next generation of hardware. And here's one of the first players, which should be in shops over here in October. A lot of big names have been involved in developing this machine, and they're hoping it's going to take over the world. All of the software comes on CDs, and this machine plays music and photo CDs as well. The interactive CDs include both information titles like encyclopedias, dictionaries, and educational software, and of course, games. The machine has fantastic graphics and sound capabilities. This is the opening sequence of a game called Microcosm. The people are digitized actors, but the helicopter is computer generated. This is the space simulated game called Total Eclipse. It's still at a very early stage of development, but you can still get a sense of the, ah, the power of the platform. Ooh. There will be 10 titles ready when the machine is launched, with at least another 10 by Christmas, including this one, Crash and Burn. This is a CD full of images. To encourage 
to game developers to use the capabilities of the studio, they are given a library of 200 CDs full of images and sounds they can use for free. The most obscure image I could find was this animal there from Borneo. Slow Loris. A slow Loris. Could it be the new Sonic? But I'm going to leave you with the latest way of watching TV. It's called the Virtual Vision Sport. It's a portable TV with a difference. It gives you the effect of a giant TV screen hanging about 10 feet in front of you in midair. Oh, yo, yo, oh, the football game. Oh, man. Is he right? In a world of his own. And that 3DO system will be out in Britain next April. Steady on, Z-Man, steady on. Other hardware manufacturers are bringing out their own CD systems too. This is the Commodore CD32. This will be out in your shops uh, next month. It's basically an Amiga 1200 with a CD drive, but 50 games are promised by Christmas. There are lots of reasons why software on CD is taking over the world. They're a lot cheaper to produce than cartridges or floppies, and they're very difficult to pirate. But the main reason is that a single CD can hold as much information as 80 cartridges or a staggering 800 floppy disks. And that means you can store video footage directly onto the disk. One of the first games to do that was this one, Night Trap. But even with all that extra information, the picture quality is still pretty grainy, isn't it? It's not like, it's not like your TV. That's because your television picture is made up of 25 different pictures a second, and each of those 25 pictures is made up of 100 million bits of information. That's two and a half thousand million bits a second. Existing CD systems like the Mega CD can only cope with one million bits of information a second. That's why they can only produce this rather grainy image in a quarter of the screen. So what you need for real full motion video is a way of storing loads of pictures on the CD without using up so much of the memory. Here's two frames from that sequence of Andy waving. It's a bit like a spot the difference competition and that difference is fairly small once the first frame has been recorded on cd the computer can produce the second frame just by knowing what's changed and that information takes up very little memory and this cd player has a little add-on black box that lets you do exactly that it will let you store 74 minutes of music and video on a single cd stuff like this from Dire Straits. Now, initially, uh, only music videos will be available, but later on in the year, they promise us that you'll be able to get feature films. And full motion video opens the floodgates for more realistic games. This is the FMV version of The Seventh Guest. Now for this week's news and previews. This is the Exterminator. It's a nifty little converter for the snares that is also a cheap device. It will even play protected carts like Star Fox. Star Fox is the American version of Star Wing. Like most cheap devices, codes will enable you to get extra lives, extra energy and to reach advanced levels. Sega of America are introducing a rating system for all their own label games. Jurassic Park and Roadrunner on the Game Gear are the first ones to get a rating and they'll be getting GA, which stands for General Audience. However, there are no plans to introduce these ratings over here. Time to dust the cobwebs off your super scope, because at long last, there's a new game. This is Yoshi's Safari on the snares. The two chums have been thrust into a shoot 'em up extravaganza. Mario hops aboard his green scaly pal to bag as many wild beasts as he can. That should be out in November. And now for some more games reviews. Pop and Twinbee on the snares is a cutesy shoot 'em up featuring two of the characters from the popular fantasy shooter Parodius. In this game, the characters fly through equally bizarre landscapes in their matching spaceships. Sweet. Or is it? Here's Cathley flying her pretty blue ship. This is a good fun shoot 'em up. It has some humorous characters and lovely cheerful music. You can play on your own or with a friend. There's lots happening so you don't get bored. Sometimes it's hard to see where you are because there's so many things on the screen at once. You need different weapons to kill different baddies. The end of level bosses are really good. They have an outer shell so you have to kill them twice. It can be really hard so it's lucky you can get a friend to join in at any time. When there's two players you can team up and use the other spaceship as a weapon. This game's got lots of action, lots of character, and lots of fun. I'd buy it. The graphics are excellent, especially the use of Mode 7 on the bosses. Cute graphics and cute music make for a really good game. Not one to play over and over, though. Excellent graphics, but a bit too cute for my taste. It was a good game, though. And the scores for Pop and Twinbee, the girls gave it a fat 4 out of 5, and the boys gave it a fat 4 out of 5, too.
Soccer Kid on the Amiga has to roam the world to find all the pieces of the Shattered World Cup with only a football to help him. Here's Tal to kick off. The first thing that struck me about this game was the excellent presentation. And I think it's good that you have a learning section that teaches you all the moves. To aid you during a game, the only weapon you have is a football with which you can do various tricks. You can do overhead kicks, you can stand on the ball, roll on it, you can do high jumps with which you can reach a platform, and if you lose your ball, you can easily regain it. During the game, you have to collect 11 player cards to make up the whole team. This will access a bonus stage where a piece of the cup may be found. There's also a time limit. As you can see, here I'm not having much luck. Each stage is set in a different country to which there are many levels. You cannot select where to start from. You must complete the game in certain order of countries. Here we are in Russia. The annoying thing about this game is the music, but luckily we can switch that off. This is a great game with great potential, but you must be patient with it, as complete mastery of all the moves takes time. I found the title a bit misleading because it was not a sports game. The ball was hard to control and the music was annoying. It's not instantly appealing, but the graphics get better and better on each level. It's one worth sticking with. And the scores for Soccer Kid, the girls gave it an average 3 out of 5, and the boys gave it a fat 4 out of 5. This Monday, sweaty hands across the country will be able to grab hold of the most hyped game since Sonic 2. Mortal Kombat claimed to be the most graphic beat-em-up ever. Digitised characters literally rip the hearts out of each other's bodies and tear off each other's heads. So here it is then, the first showing on British television of the game that everybody's talking about. This is Mortal Kombat. Now, the software company behind this are hoping that all the hype will sell some more copies of the game. But as a beat-em-up goes, it's no more violent than any other you can buy. The difference is that like the coin-ops in the arcades that have a switch that turns off the violence, Mortal Kombat got a gore code included. Now, a gore code is simply a cheat that lets you turn the violence on or off like a tap. This is it without the cheat. And this is it with it. I don't know what all the fuss is about myself. That cheat is only supposed to be available to anybody over the age of 18, but of course by now it's been published in all the magazines. Listen, take it from me, it doesn't add anything to the gameplay. And bear this in mind before you part with your hard-earned. In a month's time, the best beat-em-up ever comes to the Mega Drive. Good old Street Fighter 2. The annoying thing about Mortal Kombat isn't the violence or even the hype. It's the fact that, once again, video games will be put under the spotlight and given bad press by people who really don't know what they're talking about. What a load of scrotty rubbish! Of course video games can't make you violent. And anybody who says they can, I'll rip off their heads and write their name on the wall with the blood from their tonsils. <laughs> I've been playing video games for ages and... I've been playing video games for ages and it hasn't affected me. Right! <laughs> I'm gonna tell you this cheat once more. It's how to get to the cheat menu on Bloody Blows for the Amiga. All you have to do on the tournament screen is pull both joysticks back for ten seconds. I said ten seconds to get to the cheat menu. <laughs> What are you looking at? I've been playing video games for ages and... Uh, what are you looking at? If you want to uh, access the Data Blast, set your video recording now. Uh, competition time now. We've got a CDI player and some software to give away. Competition question is very simple. What do the letters FMV stand for? If you think you know, why not give us a call on 0891 700 100. Calls will cost you no more than 25p, but check with whoever pays the phone bill before you pick up the phone. The lines will stay open till midnight on Monday. And if that wasn't enough, you will also receive the funky Bad Influence t-shirt. And hey, get this, a copy of Namrud's latest album. Girls, <gasps> get rigging in. And also you can write with any comments or ideas you'd like to see featured. But that's it for this week. Bye. Uh, just before we go, though, I'd like to point out that I did write all the credits for this week's programme on my pen pad. See ya.